Join me, if you would, for a word of prayer this morning. Loving God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Open our minds, help us to grow. Amen. So today we are beginning a brand new sermon series that will last for about a month. will take us right up until uh, Thanksgiving. And the title of the series is Counterfeit Gods. And um, I got the idea, and I'm recommending a book to go along with this series for any of you that want to dive a little bit deeper. This is a book by a guy in New York, uh, Tim Keller, pastor of Redeemer Presbyterian Church, and it's called Counterfeit Gods. And so we have copies down in our bookstore. You can get it on Amazon for your Kindle, however you like to read. But um, uh, I'll be quoting him from time to time uh, over the next uh, month. As a minister, I am often asked, what I think will be the greatest challenge for Christians and for the church in the 21st century. And my answer to that question is actually pretty straightforward and pretty simple. It's secularization and idolatry. Secularization and idolatry. Our culture is becoming more and more secular, which means that faith, church, spirituality, and worshiping the one true God often takes a back seat to other things. I don't think that it's necessarily intentional, but I do see this happening more and more and more. Uh, Charles Taylor, who is a Canadian philosopher, wrote a a profound book called uh, A Secular Age. And in the book, he talks about this. He says, the change that I want to define and trace is one which takes us from a society in which it was virtually impossible not to believe in God, to one in which faith, even for the staunchest believer, is one human possibility among others. In other words, we are shifting from a society where almost everybody believed in God and lived a life consistent with that belief, to one in which many no longer believe in God, and for the ones that do, their commitment and their faith is not as evident as it once was. So this is a part of the process that we call secularization. Other things become just as important. In the book that I'm recommending by Keller, he talks about idolatry. But what he says is very interesting. He says it's not necessarily bad things that become idols in our lives. It's good things that get out of balance. He says, what is an idol? It is anything more important to you than God, anything that you seek to give you what only God can give. A counterfeit God is anything so central and essential to your life that should you lose it, your life would feel hardly worth living. So today and in the coming weeks, we're going to talk about some of these counterfeit gods and how we can make sure that we continue to worship and praise the one true God. How do we make sure that we don't let the counterfeit gods become our primary source of worship and adoration? This morning, we find ourselves in the Old Testament. We've been in the New Testament for a while on the uh, uh, Heart of Christianity series. We find ourselves back in the uh, the book of Exodus, the latter part of the book, chapter 20, 32. And if you're familiar with the story, then you know but by this point, Moses has led the Israelites out of Egypt. Uh, at first, they were happy to be freed from slavery, to be led out of bondage. But it doesn't take them long before they start complaining. They want food. They want water. They even go as far as to say sometimes, we wish we were back in Egypt. At least we had something to eat and drink. I've always admired Moses as a leader because uh, he was a great example of how you can lead in the face of constant bickering and complaining. He had a group of hard-nosed people with a short memory, and he remained faithful to God and persistent in the midst of all the challenges that he faced. Well, the Israelite people wandered through the desert for many years in search of the promised land, and their journey is certainly symbolic of our lives. The journey that all of us take, full of ups and downs, uh, setbacks and disappointments, frustrations and questions, expectations and regrets. Our text today, Exodus 32, tells us that while Moses is up on Mount Sinai, 
receiving the Ten Commandments, Aaron is left in charge of the people. Moses is gone for a long time. The Israelites grow restless, as they often do. And they go to Aaron saying, come and make gods for us. Who shall go before us? As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And so Aaron, being a much weaker leader than Moses, gives in. And he says, "Uh, gather all your jewelry and earrings and that of your family and bring them to me. And the Bible tells us that he took all these things and he melted them together and he made a mold and he created a golden calf for them to worship. Well, meanwhile, back up on Mount Sinai, the Lord tells Moses, go down at once. Your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have acted perversely. They have turned from me. And they are now worshiping a golden calf as their God. God is angry and is ready to take out his wrath on the Israelites. But Moses pleads with God and asks God to spare them. He returns down from the mountain. He's holding the two tablets in his hands. And as soon as he approaches the camp, he hears the celebration, the revelry, and he sees the golden calf, and his anger overcomes him, and he throws the tablets down to the ground, and they shatter into pieces. And the text tells us that he took the calf that they had made, he burned it with fire, he grounded it to powder, and he scattered it in the water, and he made the Israelites drink it. He was mad. Now, it's very easy for us to read some of these passages in the Old Testament and ask ourselves, what does this have to do with us? How how is this relevant to our lives? What does it matter if a bunch of stiff-necked Israelites made a golden calf and decided to worship it? It's easy to dismiss Scripture and to say, this has nothing to do with us. This happened, you know, thousands of years ago. And we don't make the connection. We think a golden calf. Who worships a golden calf? The Israelites did. What about us? I'm here to tell you this morning that we still have our golden calves. And I'm going to call them this series counterfeit gods. In fact, there may be more counterfeit gods today than there were in the time of Moses. What do I mean by that? Well, let's take a few minutes and and think about this. What are the counterfeit gods of the 21st century? What are the things that we are guilty of worshiping uh, in addition to or sometimes in place of God? I'm going to name some this morning, and you can add to this list if you'd like. Counterfeit God number one is actually easy. It's money. We live in a world where it's all about money. Those who don't have any money want more of it, and those who have lots of it don't want to lose it. Now, I don't know anybody who would say, you know, I wish I had less money. In fact, if you feel that way this morning, you're in luck, because in about 15 minutes, we're going to pass the offering plate. And you can write a big old check to Wood My Christian Church and help solve your problem that you have. There are few things in our world that motivate people the way that money does. And this is understandable because it takes money to pay for the basic necessities of life, food, shelter, clothing. But there are many, and there's always been many misunderstandings about money. There's the widespread misunderstanding that money in and of itself will bring about more satisfaction in life. And the only people who know that money is not the answer to all problems are those who have a lot of it, and yet they're still not satisfied. Another misunderstanding is that more money will bring you more happiness. But there's been lots and lots of studies that show that that's not necessarily the case. I mean, this could be true to some degree. Money brings about a little more security. You can buy some more stuff. It gives you more options. But the chances of you being happy in the future, if you're not happy right now with what you have, are pretty slim. If it's true that wealth brings about happiness and satisfaction, then shouldn't the wealthiest people in our society be the happiest and the most satisfied? But often that's not the case. 
I know many people who are financially set. They're, they're taken care of. But some of them are some of the most unhappy people that I know because they're restless. They have everything to live with, but sometimes they long for something to live for. Tim Keller says money is the most common counterfeit God that there is. When it takes hold of your heart, it blinds you to what is happening. It controls you through your anxieties and lust, and it brings you to put it ahead of other things. For some, this comes in the form of worshiping the stock market. Some are obsessed with it. We watch it. We check it. Have it on our cell phones. One person once said, we've replaced God with the invisible hand of the market And we substituted market value for moral value and attributed all that was good and right to the power of the market to make it so. It's the market now that has all the godlike qualities. It's all knowing. It's all present. It's all powerful. It's even eternal. It's unable to be resisted or questioned. Money makes a great servant in life, but a terrible master. And and, and the point of this is not to, to feel bad if you're successful or to feel bad if you've done well. The point of this is Don't find your ultimate security in money. Counterfeit God number two, social status. We want to know the right people. We want to be in the right place. We want to go to the right parties. We want to see our kids at the right schools. We want to have the right connections. And so what happens is people treat certain people differently if they think that they can help them climb the ladder. But have you ever been around somebody who... Uh, simply wanted to be your friend in order to get something, but when they realized that you couldn't help them get what they wanted and they wanted nothing to do with you, that seems to happen a lot. Social status can quickly become a counterfeit God, but Jesus was not concerned about social status. He was concerned with the people who were left out. He was concerned with the people that society had, had pushed to the margins. Those are the people he really cared about. Counterfeit God number three is outer beauty, and related to that is sex. It's amazing how much time and money we spend trying to make ourselves look younger and more beautiful. When Megan tells me to lose weight, I tell her I don't want to fall victim to this counterfeit God. I want to keep my my playing weight up. And you know what? There's nothing wrong with taking care of ourselves And with wanting to look good until it becomes obsessive and it dominates our lives and our budgets. I heard a great story uh, from the Swan Ball a couple years ago. I'm going to share it with you. Many of you know the Swan Ball. It's a a nice event that happens here in Nashville and raises money for Cheekwood. Well, at the Swan Ball, there's tents, you know, that are spread out and there's a walkway between the tents. And somebody once said that there were... And I'm not picking on the ladies, but this is funny. There were two women that were walking one way from one tent, and there was another lady walking this way. And, and the person that told me the story was walking behind the two ladies. And so the two ladies walked up, and this lady walked up, and they said, Ah, oh, hey, sweetie, it's good to see you. You look beautiful tonight. I love your outfit. That purse is adorable. Where would you get those shoes? Boom, boom, boom. And then they passed each other, and they kept walking, and the person kept following them. And then the two women looked at each other as like, Have you ever seen a dress as hideous as that? Those shoes were horrible. I cannot believe she wore those. True story. We pay a lot of attention to outer beauty. Perhaps it's time we pay more attention to inner beauty. We're guilty of neglecting the inner beauty and focusing on how people look. We have a culture that's more concerned with outer beauty than inner beauty, but we know that God does not see us this way. God looks on the heart, and God is calling us to look past appearances so that we can find out what's on the heart. Counterfeit God, number four, family and children. And I say this carefully as a husband as a father of three, a six-year-old, a four-year-old, and a three-month-old. I love my family dearly. I'm always thinking about how I can be a better dad, how I could be a better husband, how I could spend more time with them, be present with them. Megan's sick this weekend, so I got to spend a lot of time with the older two yesterday. But we live in an age where many parents love and dote on their children. We give them everything that they want, And sometimes the parents can forget that that we're called to be parents first and not just their buddy. 
There's a fine line between loving your children and idolizing them, giving them everything under the sun. I once heard somebody say, if we gave our children half of what they have, they would still have more than twice what they needed. Let me say that again. If we gave our children half of what they have, they would still have twice what they needed. I think that's true. But that's a hard one. Because rarely do you tell or hear somebody say that you should love your family less or spend less time with them. But you can't turn them into an idol. Counterfeit God 5. And this is a big one. Work, career, success. Many of us are guilty of being workaholics. And usually our intentions are good. We're passionate about our jobs. We want to provide for our families. We want to climb the ladder and get the next promotion or raise. But in the midst of that, we can lose our sense of balance very quickly. And we can live to work rather than working to live. We can forget how important it is to spend time with our family. Rarely will you hear somebody on their deathbed say, "Ah, I wish I would just spent a little more time at the office and done a few more deals. Work can quickly become a counterfeit God, and we're good at rationalizing it away. Uh, Tim Keller makes an interesting point. He was once talking about the people of Manhattan who were secular and enlightened. And when they hear of something like the uh, Abraham Isaac story from the Old Testament, where God calls uh, Abraham to you know, place Isaac on the altar, they think, oh, how ridiculous is that? Child sacrifice. How primitive. That is ridiculous. But yet it's the same New York people that are working jobs from six in the morning until nine at night, and they are actually committing child sacrifice at the time. The joke's on them. Fascinating to think about that. Counterfeit God number six, our stuff. And what do I mean by stuff? I mean everything, houses, cars, TVs, furniture, designer clothing, shoes, purses, jewelry, watches, all the things that we think we have to have to be satisfied in life. But the joke is always on us because as soon as we get the next thing, it's not long before we want the next thing. I think I told this story uh, a number of years ago. Um, I got a gift card for my birthday to one of my uh, favorite shops here in town, uh, the Oxford Shop. Uh, Great store, uh, not cheap. Uh, I went in there, took my gift card, and I found a needlepoint belt that I really loved. And my gift card, I don't even think, paid for half of it. But I said, I got a gift card, so I need to buy this belt. So I bought the belt. I love the belt. It looks great with khaki pants and pink shirts, kind of my go-to outfit in life. And uh, But it wasn't long before I had the belt and decided I need another belt. The first belt wasn't good enough. I needed one with a different pattern. It's a slippery slope. And there's nothing wrong with buying nice stuff, but we can all admit that sometimes it becomes excessive and over the top, and we have to watch that. Counterfeit God number seven, and this is relevant right now, political parties. I love the fact that our church has very passionate Republicans and Democrats, as well as everything else in between. That's the way it's supposed to be, I think. In fact, it would be boring any other way. But what I don't like is when politics from either side gets in the way of making sound decisions. Sometimes we're so committed to our political party that we won't bend on anything. We we won't think for ourselves. We won't stray from the party line. And we often hold our political candidates as gods in and of themselves, and then we're always disappointed when they don't deliver, and they never do the way that we thought they would. Counterfeit God number eight, conflict. What do I mean by that? I mean, there are some people in life that worship drama and conflict. If everything is going well, if it's a peaceful time, they're not happy. And some people live to create drama and they thrive on this. And this happens in marriages. It happens in families. It happens at work, in friendships, at the church. Just about anywhere people come together with different opinions and perspectives. It's why so many people love reality TV. There's always conflict and drama. Always. My grandfather on my mother's side once made a comment. She said, the more time, or he said, the more time I spend around people, the more I love my cat Fluffy. 
And he was serious. Lastly, this morning, counterfeit God number nine, ourselves. There are many people who worship themselves. They call that narcissism is the official term for it. They think that life revolves around them. And the concept of thinking about other people and putting others first does not even begin to cross their mind. Jesus said, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Any who want to become my followers must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. And if we're not careful, we can turn ourselves into counterfeit gods. Ralph Waldo Emerson once said these words, and I think they're so true. A person will worship something. Have no doubt about that. We may think our tribute is paid in secret in the dark recesses of our hearts, but it will come out. That which dominates our imaginations and our thoughts will determine our lives and our character. Therefore, it behooves us to be careful what we worship, for what we are worshiping we are becoming. And I think as humans, we're hardwired to worship something. And we better worship God, because if we don't worship God, then we're going to find something else, any of the things that I've mentioned, or plenty of other things, and we're going to worship that in life, and that's not going to be healthy. And like Keller says, it may not necessarily be bad things in and of themselves. It might be perfectly normal, healthy things. But if you let that get out of balance, then you're going to have a problem. So what are we doing to make sure that God remains the object of our worship? What are we doing to make sure that our counterfeit gods are kept in check? These are good questions. And these are the questions that we're going to wrestle with over the next few weeks. But just like the Israelites, if we're not careful, we can turn away from the God who created us, the God who sustains us, and the God who rules the universe. Remember the first two commandments. You shall have no other gods before me. And you shall not make for yourself an idol. How are we doing following these commandments? Amen.